Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art. My name is Simon Elliott. I'm the Deputy Director here, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to our Perspective Asia seminar. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners upon the land upon which we meet, the Jagara and Turrbal people, and extend that welcome to other First Nations people that we are lucky enough to have in our room to today. Obviously, as an art, in an art gallery context, uh, context the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander creativity has a huge impact on the art and craft and design of this country, and that's something I want to acknowledge. Well, welcome to GOMA and Perspective Asia. And I'd also like to acknowledge that we have the Honorary Consul Caspar Cooper from the Netherlands with us. And I'd, I'd like to also extend a welcome to Professor Caitlin Byrne, the director of the Griffith Asia Institute. Our presenter, Greg uh, Dvorak. And importantly, today we have a room full of our APT interlocutors who have come from around the region to join us over the last few days. And it's been a terrific and a great delight and a privilege to have you here. Um, and our valued colleagues, welcome. Tonight is our seventh Perspective Asia for 2017, and we're delighted to be working with the Griffith Asia Institute at Griffith University to bring you a series of invigorating, informative and insightful talks by leaders in diverse fields uh, discussing society, culture, politics, the arts of Asia Pacific. I'd like to welcome and thank Professor Caitlin Byrne, the director of Griffith Asia Institute and her team at the Institute for their ongoing and close collaboration with our gallery's Australian Centre for the Asia Pacific Art. So Zara, Ruth, Ruben, Turun and uh, Ruha, thank you. Um, and to develop, to make sure this Perspective Asia program is well developed. It's now in its 13th year. Uh, it's a hugely important initiative for us providing a context for a wide-ranging exhibition and cinema program profiling Asia and Pacific art. I'd also like to thank the Griffith Conservatorium of Music because they were giving us a beautiful interlude as we were having drinks, and uh, importantly, our wine sponsor, Yearing Station. Tonight, we have a, a, a really important opportunity to learn and engage with the history of, and contemporary realities of a region little covered in Australia, and that is Northern Oceania. It's no accident that this is the geographical area that we are very excited to be engaging with in it, through two dynamic projects for the next APT, and that is APT 9 in November of next year. This engagement speaks to the heart of the gallery's vision to be at the leading institution of contemporary art of Australia, Asia, and the Pacific. Tonight, we're privileged to learn about the context in which contemporary art is developing in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Our special guest, Greg Dvorak, is superbly placed to take us on this journey. Greg is an academic and curator with a personal background of growing up, studying and working between the Republic of the Marshall Islands, Japan and United States. He is currently Associate Professor of the International Cultural Studies at Wasidak University in Tokyo. He is also founding director of Project 35, a grassroots network that aims to raise awareness about the Pacific Island regions in Japan through art and scholarly exchange. Uh, his lecture tonight provides a historic overview of the intersections of colonialism, militarism, weapon testing, climate change, and indigenous resistance over the past century in the Republic of the Marshall Islands as a way of understanding the role and development of art in this locale. It should be fascinating. With that, please, if you could join with me in welcoming Greg. <clears throat> Thank you, Vox. Thank you very much, Simon. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, that's quite a very nice welcome, and I thank you all for coming here. Um, I am part of this interlocutor group uh, for APT of next year, and um, so I feel kind of a little strange being the only one who <laughs> speaks in the evening. Everyone else has spoken already. Um, but thank you so much to uh, the uh, to Kwagoma, to uh, Griffith University, and a special uh, thank you very much to the indigenous uh, people of this land who make it possible for us to be here and who have an important relationship also to other First Nation peoples around the world, including the people about whom I will be speaking this evening. Um, I should have put this 
slide first just to say Yagwe, which is a Marshallese welcome. Uh, Yagwe means I love you. So I'm just going to be real cute and I'll say I love you. <laughs> um, Yagwe can be spelled two ways. I spell it the proper way, which is Yo, which means uh, love, and Kwe is you. Um, but this is the greeting that Marshallese people uh, say to each other on the street. Um, when passing each other. It is, it is a hello, it is a goodbye, it also means I love you, but it also means it's what people say when they say, um, I'm sorry about what happened in the war, uh, or people who died uh, because of nuclear testing, which I'm sure you are all aware of in the, in the, uh, the Marshall Islands. Um, so it's an expression of love and compassion. And um, I believe it's most appropriate to say that in, in terms of grounding this and letting us think a little bit more and reflect on what it means to be connected and to kind of unabashedly love each other and love each other's humanity. And I think that is sort of the saving grace that gives Marshall Islanders the kind of dignity and the power that they have to um, live in the world today. I want to dedicate this lecture to my friend Teresia Tewa, who unfortunately passed away at a very early age this year. She was, in my mind, one of the absolute best scholars of Pacific studies. And she said these very prophetic and powerful words, which was that we sweat and cry salt water so we know that the ocean is really in our blood. And I believe that these tears and this sweat, the labor, the, um, the pain, of which my friend Sana was, saying, was talking about today, um, is a very important thing to reflect upon in terms of indigenous histories and also in Pacific histories, and to consider that this fluid body that connects us is not just a blank space, that in fact it is an important medium of connection, and in fact blood. It is something that flows between us, and we talk about Asia um, and Pacific very abstractly, but I would like to consider what these kinds of things actually might mean. And today I want to reflect on the idea that um, we're talking about very specific places. I don't intend to speak about all of the Pacific or speak for it. I'm not indigenous to the Pacific. But as uh, Simon alluded, I grew up um, for the first 10 years of my life in the Marshall Islands, in what is now the Republic of the Marshall Islands, which is an independent republic, which used to be colonized by the United States for nearly 50 years, and before that, 30 years by Japan, and before that, something like 20 years by Germany. And before that, some abstract number of years by Spain, although they weren't all that involved. Um, so this is a place that has a very, very deep history. And yet I want to step back a moment and talk about what we're talking about when we think of the Pacific. Because this is a word that is bandied about quite a bit in Australia. I, I went to the ANU for my PhD, and I know that Australia has its own particular optic of what Oceania or the Pacific is about. And that's important to acknowledge because this is the vastest, largest, most significant, um, possibly most diverse place on Earth. And so what are we talking about? Uh, very often we hear these terms poly, mela, micro. Nisha, of course, means uh, islands from the Greek. But poly mean, meaning many, mela, black, and it's referring mainly to skin color. These are very racist terms. These are very colonialist terms and they have a particular history that we need to acknowledge. Micro refers to smallness. Are these islands actually small? Well, as a human being, if you walk around a small island, so to speak, in the Pacific, in the middle of Micronesia, you'll find that it'll take you many hours, sometimes even a day. It's going to be very hot. <laughs> you'll run out of water. I mean, we're not talking about smallness in the true sense. We're talking about a particular perspective of empire. And so I might point out that there's also an Australianesia. <laughs> and it is not, this is different from Austronesia, by the way, because there's something called Austronesia, which is a particular linguistic and, and uh, often um, what we should say, uh, archaeological complex in terms of thinking about these kinds of histories, piecing them together, making sense of the great migrations across the Pacific. But Australianesia is a particular optic. We could talk about a, a Francoesia, a French optic, which aligns the people of uh, Kanaki or New Caledonia and uh, Tahiti with um, the metropole of Paris. Uh, we could talk about Japanesia, which is a place that I would like to talk about to you tonight. 
and we could certainly speak of an Americanesia. But we could also speak about something that I might refer to as amnesia, in the sense that these particular projections of power result in forgettings, and deliberate forgettings which obscure people's lives, uh, their whole histories, their emotions, their important memories, and their whole reason for being. And so, like many of my colleagues today, I will <laughs> talk about maps for a moment. Um, this is a relatively benign map, but maps are never really benign. So, um, but this is a map of the Pacific Islands from the University of Hawaii, where I did my master's degree at the Center of Pacific Islands, uh, Center for Pacific Island Studies. And I'm going to be talking mainly about the Marshall Islands, which is north of the equator. But this is typically an area that is referred to as Micronesia. It's part of Micronesia, but there are many Micronesias, as we'll discuss. Um, I spent the first years of my life at Kwajalein Atoll in the Marshall Islands, which is the largest atoll on Earth. And this particular Marshall Islands is different from many of the other Marshall Islands. There are, in fact, um, something like 29, um, it depends on how you count them, atolls in the Marshall Islands, five independent atolls, uh, islands. There are two chains, the Sunrise Chain, the Sunset Chain, the uh, Radak and the Ralik. Um, this is a vast stretch of ocean which covers uh, 200 million uh, square miles. And yet, within that, there is this island called Kwajalein, which is the main island of Kwajalein Atoll. And I reference the Marshall Islands tonight in respect to this place. This is the place where I spent my early years, as an American, on an American military base, an American military installation, which has, without the permission of the people there, really, since 1944, been in place, a very significant military installation, which is home to, well, sort of home, to, uh, at the moment, I think it's something like 1,500 to 2,000 Americans. It fluctuates. Um, and most of those Americans are people who work as civilian contractors. So it gave me a very um, important understanding, maybe it wasn't conscious as a child, but of these kind of gaps between this military understanding of place and just blunt kind of colonialism and settler colonialism in this kind of environment. But the person who taught me most about these histories was this very wonderful woman named Netari Pound. Netari Pound is long gone from this world, but she was my boo-boo. She was my Marshallese grandmother. And I always like to talk about her when I give a presentation because I want to acknowledge that this is not knowledge that I'm sourcing myself. I'm not just going into archives and talking to people and looting their knowledge and running away with it. Maybe I am to some extent, but a lot of what I knew from a child came from her because she would sing to me in Marshallese and in Japanese and in English and those languages flowed together in my mind as being something that just kind of fit together somehow. So it became a natural question for me later when I was in high school, what is this Japan thing, for example? Um, she was our housekeeper. She was our maid. I would learn much later in my life, in fact, when I came back to do my PhD research, that she was actually a chief. She was of chiefly origin. And yet she humbled herself as a maid to work for my family so that she could provide for her grandchildren. Her experiences as a, as a chiefly elite also, though, informed some very nuanced and interesting histories, including, and here I kind of want to present a Marshallese artist actually at the same time, um, going back into the deep time history of the Marshall Islands, um, this is not from her, but this is basically, she would talk about the old days in the Marshalls. These are images that I'll share with you, just, just a couple images by um, a Marshallese photographer named Joachim de Brum, who was an early photographer in his time, um, and part Portuguese, part Marshallese, but he had the means to obtain a lot of uh, photographic equipment, took these amazing, very high definition, because of these huge silver gelatin prints of his family, and in a way resisted the colonialist urge to position people in these very orientalist kind of, you know, exotic situations. These were family photos of Marshall Islanders wearing uh, the clothing that they would have worn customarily 
um, and the sense is that they were quite complicit in these photographic endeavors and wanted to have their photos taken. This is during the German uh, colonial period in the Marshalls, which was not very long, but which um, was mainly a business endeavor. It was not a very, th there were some German schools, but um, aside from uh, missionaries and so forth that were also in the Marshall Islands, this was not as intense a colonialism. We might, it's hard to you know, analyze that, but um, as violent maybe or intense a colonialism as the following colonialisms that would come after. This is a, a chiefly family that was on Kwajalein Atoll where I lived as a child um, back in the late 1890s probably. And you can see the intimacy. Um, and even I, I want to gesture towards gender relations as well in the Marshall Islands and that children might be taken care of by other children and that men might be taking care of children as well. My focus this evening though, given the shortage of time that I have, is mainly on the Japanese and the American period. So I want to leap ahead to um, talk a little bit about a Japanese Pacific, which is something that is ver very rarely discussed. Um, I think in Australia, and this gets back to my idea of Australianesia, we talk about Japan as being an occupying force. But I want to point out that from a Japanese perspective in the 19, um, well, even the 19, 1910s and the 1920s, the idea was really that this was this whole vast southness, a southern frontier. And that in fact, um, the, the Pacific was not something that was to be conquered by a military endeavor. It was simply sort of a possible destiny for Japanese to expand into. Now, I don't mean to forgive this or to kind of apologize for that, but my point is to say that um, what emerged from this vision of a South that extended all the way out, including all of New Zealand and Australia, out to India, all of what we call Southeast Asia today, this vision of expansion um, only materialized for Japanese people in the formation of what they won um, in 1914 in a battle with Germany in, in World War I as the Nanyo Gunto, or the South Seas Islands of Micronesia. These islands became an Inin Tochido, otherwise known as a um, League of Nations mandate, a Class C mandate. Um, rather similar in some ways to the mandated territory that Australia um, managed in Australia, I mean in uh, Papua New Guinea. In New Guinea. Um, and so the League of Nations mandate began in 1922 formally, but because they had already uh, captured the Marshall Islands, effectively the Marshall Islands from a Japanese perspective was essentially a territory beginning in 1914. That white spot there is Guam. Guam was already an American territory. So there's even a very interesting dynamic between Guam and Saipan, which was part of the Mariana Islands right nearby, and yet they speak very differently about Japan because Guam was forcefully occupied by Japan in 1941. Japanese military occupations, however, this is the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Darwin, all of these other places, this expansion happens in 1941. So there's a very clear split for the people of Micronesia and these northern islands thinking about the differences and the nuances between military Japanese and the civilians who came before them, who were mostly poor, uh, they weren't all poor, but they were people who were of, of a lower class, um, very often fishermen, um, people who came with their families from Okinawa, for example. They had a very clear distinction between who Okinawans were and who Japanese were, for example. And there were also Koreans and so forth, which is another very interesting issue. So just to sort of illustrate this Jap japan -asia, even before German um, people came to uh, colonize uh, the Marshall Islands, there were these imperial visions in um, the late 1800s, in 1885, when a mission was sent to the Marshall Islands to investigate a shipwreck by the Japanese government. And you see this kind of, the, the, all these really interesting sort of watercolors, uh, they're actually full color watercolors that were painted by Suzuki Keikun and Goto Taketaro of their voyage to the Marshall Islands, very fanciful, kind of painted in this almost ukiyo-e kind of style. Um, and this is then followed by German um, set settlement and, and colonialism, but not too much settlement really. It was really only in the 1920s when Japanese people began to go to these islands when they were considered to be Japanese, at least from a Japanese perspective. And uh, many young men were sent to these islands to work as businessmen. And what I want to emphasize is that many of them learned the local language. 
Many of them also uh, had children with local women. And so there was a bit of a romanticism of this local woman, especially chiefly women, and the idea of having liaisons with them, which is romanticized in a song called The Chieftain's Daughter, for example, and sort of celebrated but also ridiculed back at, in Japan. So if you kind of hook up with a local woman, what happens in the Marshall Islands stays in the Marshall Islands. This is kind of the idea. Because many of those men also had arranged marriages back in Japan. And so as a result of this, uh, well over 50% of the population of the Marshall Islands has some Japanese blood. It's not just the Marshall Islands, it's most of the Republic of Palau, Federated States of Micronesia, and so forth. Japanese saw their um, involvement in the Nanyo Gunto, or the part of Micronesia that they settled, as being the mandate. It was a very important um, responsibility for them. They, they talked about the, the they, they professed to the League of Nations that they were a very advanced, civilized nation, just like the West, who could develop infrastructure around hospitals and um, schools and so forth. And so this is a Japanese dentist in the island of Jalut. These are Japanese families, though. Um, whole Japanese families were moving to these places. And among them, there were also Okinawans and Koreans. Uh, Korea had also been uh, annexed to Japan. And so Koreans who moved to Japan also came for opportunities to Micronesia, and some were also forced into labor eventually um, during the military campaigns. In terms of art, we see a sort of Japanese tropicalism. This is the, the Japanese scholar uh, Kawamura Minato talks about tropicalism, which is a form of orientalism, basically, that kind of romanticizes these islands. And there's a whole genre of this in Japan. You can sort of seek it out and find uh, these images. This is an image by a French-born artist who's French, Paul Jacoulet, but he grew up completely in Japan and studied in the form the woodblock printing of ukiyo-e and created some quite beautiful but also very Gauguin-esque uh, images of uh, Pacific Islanders in this area. This is a work by Kawabata Dyushi um, in another part of Micronesia. And yet, what most people were absorbing were comics, being Japan. There's <laughs> a whole emphasis towards manga uh, and comics. This is a very um, popular comic called Boken Dankichi, Dankichi the Adventurous, which was very popular between 1931 and 1939 when it was serialized uh, in Shonen Krabu, which is a manga. Uh, comic, but obviously it has a very strong racist element to it. Um, Dangichi basically mirrors what the Japanese Empire was doing in these islands, building hospitals, schools, teaching people this kind of discipline and so forth. The numbers painted on those people's bodies, and obviously they're sort of simplified into these sort of monkey-like um, all-male uh, characters who are referencing all kinds of exotic, perhaps African, uh, different um, images. Um, he painted the, the, figure, the numbers on these people because he couldn't remember their names, for example. It's part of the narrative. So very um, sketchy <laughs> kind of depictions of islanders. But this informed, in a very big way, the soldiers who would then move to these islands when they were deployed after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. So it's really um, a little bit before Pearl Harbor. In fact, the assault on Pearl Harbor was launched in part from the Marshall Islands the Japanese soldiers begin to go to these islands. Um, and they were basically just waiting for the Americans to come. They knew that this, the war would eventually reach them. I want to talk, though, about this idea of amnesia, then. So what happens is actually a rather... I mean, I don't want to say this is such an abrupt shift, but the Allies... Basically, it was all Americans who came to uh, the Marshall Islands, but. Um, the Battle of Kwajalein is the, is the invasion of the Marshall Islands. It's the effective invasion. The other atolls were, uh, there were, there were a few land invasions. Most of them were air-bombed. Um, and in January to February of 1944, um, I believe it was 23,000 American troops overwhelmed um, a relatively small number of Japanese um, forces, which included many people who were just building the bases at Kwajalein. So these were conscripted Korean laborers, about uh, 300 to 400, um, and uh, Marshallese people who were living in these islands. And there were enormous numbers of Japanese deaths, numbering somewhere between 
people say 7,500. The number that I tend to use is 8,500. Um, so this is a huge loss of life, and yet we don't even know the figures of how many Marshallese people died in this conflict. This is what we find again and again and again throughout this history. We find a narrative of American liberation from the Japanese, as if to say, and this is, again, not to excuse colonialism, but as if to say that all Japanese were in the minds of Pacific Islanders and these Micronesians, you know, nefarious people. And I want to quote Sakai Naoki, who's a cultural studies scholar in Japan, who says that evidently Japanese imperialism was grafted onto American imperialism. And we will remain enslaved to the legacies of past colonialisms in East Asia unless we are fully aware of the continuity between Japanese and US colonialisms. There was a rather smooth and shockingly um, easy transition in some ways between what happened in Japan, which John Dower refers to as the wedding photo between the Japanese emperor and Douglas MacArthur. This is not my um, theory, but it, it is commonly cited by many scholars in Japan, to what happened in the Marshall Islands. When Marshall Islanders were conscripted to bury the Japanese war dead, the people whom they had known, these are people who, you have to remember, spoke Japanese. They didn't speak English. They spoke Marshallese, of course. But they were impressed by American power, American military power, and so forth, and yet also knew that they wanted to treat the Japanese war dead with dignity. And then we have this transition from 1944 to the present in which the roles of men and for, to be a man in the Marshall Islands, uh, which is a matrilineal society in which women have considerable power in terms of land inheritance and you know, moving from generation to generation, to men being kind of at a loss for who they were and what their role meant in society, um, moving into the United States Army, which is a possibility because of the uh, post-independence compact of free association between the United States and the Re Republic of the Marshall Islands. We have Marshall Islanders who are dying in places like Iraq. This is a plaque that's dedicated to the first Marshallese war uh, death, um, Staff Sergeant Solomon Sam, for example. Going back, though, um, to this history, the U.S. trust territory of the Pacific was the um, the next step after the Japanese League of Nations mandate. And again, it did not include Guam, but basically because Guam was already a US territory, it was a complete American space. And you may also realize, of course, that the Philippines was also a, an American territory. So between Hawaii and Guam and the Philippines and really the US uh, West Coast, the United States had pretty much consumed all of Northern Oceania. From a Marshallese perspective, this meant, though, that the, the sea was closed until the 1970s. Um, the um, movement in and out of the Marshall Islands was completely blocked. Islanders could not go to different places. They, they lost touch with their Japanese relatives if they had any. These relationships were disallowed. Memories were confiscated. Japanese objects were taken. Images of, of uh, Japanese family members' photographs were taken by Americans. So you probably all know about this. In fact, there was an ABC documentary just this past week, um, foreign correspondent, about the uh, nuclear waste that is still in the Marshall Islands. But the United States tested 67 nuclear weapons in the Marshall Islands between 1946 and 1958. This is the largest of them. I'm sorry, this is, this is Operation Crossroads, but the largest of them was Operation Bravo. This is art by uh, an artist named Anram Enos, who kind of blatantly and almost simplistically, very, using very bright colors, paints these very painful histories. Um, hmm. I don't know why that disappeared. There, there used to be a missile there, but I was going to show you a photo of a missile. <laughs> Instead, I'll show you a photo of myself. Um, this is me as a child, just to lighten things up a little bit. Um, but I was basically born into this legacy, um, not exactly born into it, but my father was a missile tester on Kwajalein. Um, Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands became, in 1964, 
the successor to the nuclear tests that were happening in Bikini Atoll, in Awetak Atoll, and that rained fallout all across the northern atolls. Missiles, of course, are needed to deliver the payload. So when we talk about um, North Korea testing missiles today, it's important to note that every time North Korea tests a missile, usually Kwajalein and the Marshall Islands also test a missile, although that doesn't get much media attention. Each of those missile tests, at least when I was doing my PhD research in 2005 and 2006, cost something like 80 million US dollars. And yet the United States has only compensated Marshall Islanders $150 million for the grievances and all the trespasses that they did in these islands throughout the nuclear testing program, certainly not enough at all. So we end up with this post-Marshallese independence, post-Micronesian independence US hegemony um, in the northern part of Oceania. And I believe it is this, that this allows this kind of conversation that we should be having about people's stories, about people's lives, about com communication even between North and South Oceania, that there's something in there that deprives people of funding even, to get funding for the arts, for example, since um, I am thinking about um, helping APT in some way to, to think about these considerations. Th this is not by chance. And it is not by chance that the site of the last Marshallese village on Kwajalein Atoll is now a golf course. And so I'm reminded again by Auntie <laughs> Sana and her brilliant presentation today that when we talk about these beautiful landscapes, they're filled with pain. People play golf here. And yet, only 15 minutes away by boat is Ibai, which is a ghetto where the workers who, for very cheap wages, work on the base where I grew up. And they live, there's a population of about 13,000 people, which is always growing. Over 50% of the population is below the age of 18. And yet they make sense out of it. And it's, it's a vibrant, very passionate and interesting community. And yet a lot of people need to leave. And part of this has to do with climate change. So I want to speed up a bit so that we have some time for questions and comments. But, um, you know, if we look at the, the Japanese battlescape today, there's still abandoned war junk all over the place. No one ever cleaned that up. And some people make sense out of this. And this is this, actually this woman's home in Chuk, in central Micronesia. But we find these places all over the Marshall Islands as well. And now we also have space age Cold War junk by the Americans. These are old, rotten um, radar domes. There are radars inside of these places. The water has been shut off on this particular island. People don't have electricity, even though they used to, because the US deemed this island unnecessary. And some Japanese remember these times. These are bereaved families that I worked with for some time, going back to these islands, remembering the war dead. Um, very earnestly, and yet there are others who serve sort of the purpose of this vigilante memorialism. They go to these islands to do the remembering that the, the nation of Japan doesn't do, and it can often be a very right-wing practice of trying to sort of revision, revise history, and talk about how Japan was once a glorious nation, and here we are, we need to recognize these war dead, at the expense of often not even thinking about the other war dead, all the Koreans, all of the Marshallese, all of the other people, not to mention the Americans, but still just to consider the, the nuances of this. And ambivalent memories. Uh, Marshall Islanders and other people like Palauans throughout the Pacific, in the Northern Pacific, tend to have some rosy memories of the settler times than when Japanese were there, but it's certainly not all good. Um, these are reported back in Japan as being very positive things sometimes. And there are not enough liberal and maybe centrist, I don't know how to say this, but cultural people who have a sense of nuance in Japan, I think, today, who ask these questions, who confront these histories. Instead, it tends to fall very far on the right, people who want to remember these memories in a very specific way, and other people who tend to look at this only in terms of the nuclear holocaust in the Marshall Islands without thinking about what that actually means to people on the ground. So how do Marshall Islanders respond? Very quickly, I just want to run through some of these images. This is not a great image, but uh, it's, not, it's very pixelated, but this is another image by Anram Enos. If you go to the Marshall Islands, you'll see his paintings all over the place, but uh, very bluntly kind of um, depicting Paradise Lost uh, when the, the people of Bikini were relocated from their islands um, and moved and moved and moved again and again and again 
Anra Menos's work is featured very proudly at the Marshall Islands uh, Parliament, the Nitijela. Um, this is, these are the two different um, kind of seats in the, the Congress. But we also see revival of tattooing, different ways of thinking about hybrid Marshallese, Micronesian, Tuvaluan, different kinds of designs, but also incorporating, you can see sort of a, a, a Japanese element into that. And I think some people in this room are familiar with these people. Um, this is the Jackie Yet group in the Marshall Islands, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, um, and their involvement in trying to revive these different kinds of um, weaving textile technologies as a way of remembering again. This a simple act of remembering becomes resistance, you see. That's, that's what I want to emphasize. Street art depicting cultural heritage, even these very utopian kinds of scenes, painting them in this very urban sort of scape in the Marshall Islands becomes an act of resistance. Um, and then we have some new sort of, I don't know how to position this, but um, tagging, uh, painting on these mats, for example, for uh, the first birthday party, which is a very important ceremony for, Jap for Marshallese people. The Marshallese film industry is also thriving, if we could call it an industry, but it's certainly a very popular medium. Um, Marshall Islanders are producing a lot of films. There's also a small art initiative called the Jumbo Arts Initiative. It's mainly, uh, it includes a lot of expat artists, but there are also people who are um, being nurtured by this in the islands. And I want to finish by just talking about some people who I think are really heroes of the Marshalls today. One of them is Alson Kellen. He's a navigator, he's an artist, he's an activist. He has revived Marshallese uh, long distance canoeing and navigation in the Marshall Islands. He's from the atoll of Bikini originally, has been displaced, his whole family has been displaced. And now he's grappling, grappling, grappling with uh, climate change. And I actually visited his home and there was that day, the floods were just coming in as they do pretty much every day. Uh, it literally flooded landscapes. And when the water comes up in these islands, because of global warming and climate change that's happening today, the water doesn't just come up from the ocean, it actually bubbles up from underneath the soil because the water table rises. And you can't grow crops that way. You can't, you know, the grass dies, the trees dies, the trees die. How do people deal with this? And yet it's remarkable how positive Marshall Islanders can be, how optimistic. And I certainly don't want to essentialize, but I do want to point out that this level of endurance, this is built over thousands of years, 3,000 years of living in these islands. And the guts to say that we will not go down with this ship, this is not about us just accepting some, you know, mediocre deal <laughs> to kind of get paid out or something. It's not about the money, it's not about compensation, it's about dignity and it's about life. One of my biggest heroes is my friend Kathy Jetnell Kitchener, who is, I believe, working with us here, um, who addressed the United Nations in 2014 and said, we deserve to do more than just survive. We deserve to thrive. It is not just about survival. It's about having the same benefits that everybody else does, having, you know, being able to address these concerns. Kathy is a spoken word artist. She's extremely gifted. Um, her words have moved people all over the world. Um, I was involved in the Honolulu Biennial, the first biennial in Honolulu this last year, and she produced an installation work there as well, which is very moving. Beyond the Marshall Islands, there are other, con other artists like Craig Santos Perez from Guam, or Guahan as it is formerly known, Marquita Mickey Davis, a different video artist, and they're referencing navigation and thinking about uh, climate change. We can also find art like this from the United Artists of Belau Collective, UWAB Collective from Palau, uh, referencing Japanese colonialism and war. Uh, wood carving from Palau, and this fantastic painting by Sam Adelbay in Palau, where, again, very similar history to the Marshall Islands, but um, referencing nuclear testing, which did not happen in the Marshall Islands, but if you look closely at this, you can actually see the, the mushroom cloud there, and the Pepsi cans in the um, foundations of this building. This, bu this painting, though, I'm showing it to you because it was actually um, supposed to be presented to the United Nations and the ambassadors of the United Nations from the, what was then the Trust Territory of the Pacific uh, in, in these islands. 
uh, the ambassador said, no, this would not be a good thing to show in the United States. It's too critical. So censorship. And this painting is somewhere deep in the storage of Palau National Museum. So um, from another part of Micronesia, my friend Katerina Tewa, uh, the younger sister of Teresia, whom I opened this talk with, uh, is doing right now an, in um, Carriage Works in Sydney an installation about her family's um, place of, of uh, heritage, Banaba, in Kiribati, which is another part of Micronesia that tends to be more familiar to Australians and New Zealanders because of the connection through phosphate mining and, and British uh, colonialism. So I want to finish just by gesturing towards some of these things in terms of art, in terms of academia as well, and the kinds of questions that we might be asking ourselves. How can we think about transoceanic, translocal, Pacific, and Asia conversations around this stuff? Um, these are not victims. These are not people who want pity. These are people who want collaboration and solidarity and alliance. And so I think it is my responsibility as a scholar to do whatever I can to connect and to network. It's part of what I'm trying to do with the network that I'm building. But between Pacific artists who could help to work together with these different communities, indigenous artists in Japan, including Ainu and Okinawans, who share very similar experiences of being colonized by Japan, indigenous artists in Taiwan, who are now reaching out to people who share a similar migration story, uh, Korean artists, nuclear-related artists who are concerned with nuclear issues, environment-related artists, and Japanese artists who are critical of empire, and of course Americans and people all over the world. But I just think these are the kinds of questions that could come up and it's important to, to address them. So with that, I say komoltara, which means thank you in Marshallese, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Greg. I know we've got time for a couple of questions, so please put up your hand. And if I can ask, when you're asking a question, if you can just let us know who you are and where you're from, and keep it nice and question-like. <laughs> <laughs> this is always good. I think we're all absorbing still. Digesting time. Digesting. So I wonder if I can ask, I'll, I'll try yeah. and warm things up a little bit, yeah. but Greg, one of the things you started with a map, and we saw a lot of discussion about maps this morning, and it's so wonderful. I don't think we have enough of, of an opportunity to really absorb some of these cartographic images of the way that we view the world. Um, but I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the Marshall Islands today and, you know, We've just seen Australia's foreign policy white paper come out, okay. casting a strategic view of the Indo-Pacific. Mm. And I wonder if that's a phrase that makes, has meaning for the Marshall Islands. The Indo-Pacific. Mm. Sorry, that's a curly kind of... That is a curly question. Okay, well, that's, that's good. Going. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you for that. Um, so I think that basically these mappings are always, uh, um, my mentor, Margaret Jolly, always spoke about um, double vision mm. in, in colonization experiences throughout the world, but especially in the Pacific, that people are always knowing kind of how they're being perceived and making sense out of that, but also knowing local mappings. I think that if you ask many people in the Marshall Islands where they're from, they will talk about the atoll and the different atolls that they come from. And so these stories of what the Pacific is and what it means to be Micronesian are things that are also there, but they're sort of maybe peripheral to what it is to be Marshall Islander in, in the Marshall Islands. And I should add that 20,000 Marshall Islanders actually live in the United States now. There's a massive exodus of people moving to places like Arkansas and Oregon. So they're very much absorbed in being in that American space. And so talking about Indo-Pacific or talking even about Australia is actually, f if, if we were to flip this and I were to take this conversation to the Marshall Islands, there would, I, would, I would argue that there would be just as many people in the Marshall Islands that say, so what's Australia like? It's, it's actually the, the, these huge divisions that I think are, are worth pointing out and naming. So I don't know what they would say about Indo-Pacific. I think it's really important to consider 
and I'm thinking about especially those of you who are dealing with, uh, you know, South Southeast issues in terms of Asia, to question the Indian Ocean and think about these other oceanic spaces and other places, especially like the Maldives, that are also dealing with, um, you know, being low-lying islands that are that are dealing with uh, sea level rise. So. Sort of program on television from the United Nation, uh, from that uh, lady and uh, husband and the little child. I'm wondering, does now nearly three years ago anything else came out of that, or is it all forgotten and, and something something should come further out of another outcome? I, I'm sorry if I, I don't understand the the, the, the United Nations. What yeah. the she spoke uh, that day in the United Nations. Oh, Kathy. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. And I mean, it was very uh, emotional. Yes. But I'm wondering now, three years, you haven't heard anything about it. What? What is? Oh, okay. The Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, so Kathy Jedno Kitchener, who uh, has started her own NGO as a part of that, she's got gotten a lot of attention, a lot of support to build different networks. She started an NGO called Jojikam, which is about empowering local people to deal with climate change, learning about different, you know, measurements and how to speak the science that needs to be spoken to address these kinds of issues. She has gone on to address many different climate forums after that. She was just most recently in Bonn um, a couple weeks ago. Um, I think it was largely because of her lobbying and the lobbying of other Marshall Islanders and, uh, and the peop they call them the Pacific Climate Warriors. Um, that the Paris Agreement was so successful. So um, it is actually something that is in progress, and I think that they're moving towards this. She's very optimistic. Um, but again, we have issues like the American president completely rejecting these sorts of things. And so um, that's exasperating and it's frustrating to people who come from the Marshall Islands. But to be quite honest, I find that most of my Marshallese friends are far more optimistic than I am. These are people who have dealt with nuclear tests on their own soil. And so um, there's a, there was an ABC documentary this past week about this. And Alison Kellen, who I was speaking about here, and also Jack Niedenthal, uh, one of the other people that was interviewed, was saying that um, if Marshall Islanders had to choose between an irradiated island that they might be able to go back to someday and an island that is underwater forever, they would pick the irradiated island. So it's, it's, it's reached a new level. And this is why it's changing the conversation quite a bit and galvanizing a lot of support and solidarity for some people. And for others, it's just a write-off, which is depressing. That there are some people that would just say, well, you know, I guess they don't matter. So, uh, but I, I, I know Kathy well, and I think that she's, she and the people around her, she's, she's not alone. There is quite a movement for this. And they have allies all over the world, and not just in the Pacific, but all over the place. I know we had a couple of questions, one mm. here, then one right at the back, and then one in the middle. Hello, thank you uh, very much for your talk. Um, my name is Tara Hogue. I'm a Métis curator based in unceded Coast Salish territories in Vancouver. Uh, and I have something to share, but I'll try to frame it as a question. Okay. <laughs> um, I recently was, um, my previous position was at an artist-run center in Vancouver called Grant Gallery, where uh, we worked on a publication project with a Squamish uh, First Nations artist uh, named Cease Weiss. Uh, and um, her family, uh, has connections to uh, Hawaii and specifically to um, Kaolave, which was also um, a sacred site uh, that was missile uh, tested by the U.S. until the water table cracked, and now it was very, you know, difficult um, for any life to thrive there. Um, and. Uh, there is a history of Kanaka uh, coming to the Pacific Northwest and marrying into Squamish families. There's actually a site in Vancouver called the Kanaka Ranch. Uh, and um, 
uh, yes, a history of marrying into uh, First Nations communities on the coast. And so I was wondering in your work with, uh, with in Honolulu, if you had come across um, any of these kinds of stories as well further up the coast. Um, and if not, that that would be maybe a connection to add to your list. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, thanks yeah. for that, yeah. Um, in terms of Kahoolawe, I mean, there were some works that were referencing bombings like Brett Graham, for example. I mean, there were some other people that were dealing with um, militarism and militarization in general um, from, a, from a clearly indigenous perspective. Um, having lived in Hawaii for a few years at least and, and thought about these issues, I mean, it's not just, uh, Kahoolawe is a devastating story. Um, but there are other stories like the, the Makua Valley, which is off limits even today, and where there's live fire testing happening right now. Um, but these migrations of a new, and you, you use the word kanaka, which I think is really interesting, because that's a word, and I don't even want to go off on this right now, because it'll take a really long time. But the, the word kanaka has so many interesting kinds of pathways, and, and these kinds of migrations. And I know that in the Pacific Northwest, that became you know, a way of, of talking about these migrants and migrant laborers, which was ne not necessarily a negative or pejorative.